Da, am crescut în Utah până la vârsta 12 și după aia m-am mutat Statul în Las Vegas. Statul care are, ca să zic așa, reședința de județ la Salt Lake City? Da. Da? Orașul uh -huh. mormonilor, nu? Vrei să știi ceva surpriză? Sunt și eu mormon. Da? Da. Bă, eu, ai, și, și cum te cheamă pe tine? Cum mă cheamă? Nu, astea sunt misionari și de-aia zice elder sau sister. A, uh -huh. acum m-am prins. Da. Deci, uh, da, deci de asta v-ați mutat voi inițial acolo. Da, pentru că -a, a venit misionarii la noi și ne-a plăcut foarte mult biserica, n-am simțit bine, bine, eu eram mică. Adică părinții mei s-au simțit foarte bine și au făcut decizia să devin în partea din biserica lor. I'm a deep religious person. I'm a Mormon. My, in my religion, we don't drink alcohol. We don't smoke, we don't drink coffee, we don't drink tea, and we don't engage in any behavior that calls into question our moral character. Look at the vast empire of Joseph Smith. His followers are called Mormons and belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Founded in 1830, the Mormon Empire now encompasses billions of dollars in financial assets and real estate holdings. A membership of seven and a half million dedicated followers and an incalculable amount of influence in city, state, and federal governments, law enforcement agencies, the CIA, and public schools. The Los Angeles Times reports of high-level influence in the FBI with nicknames like the Mormon Mafia. Other reports detail the large influence the Mormon Church wields in the financial community citing that it is the largest business corporation in the Western United States. Beyond the PR image of the Osmond family and the beautiful voices of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, what is behind this incredible organization and what, in fact, is at the root of its doctrine and theology? Today, in pursuit of Joseph Smith's original vision, the Mormon Church circles the globe with an aggressive missionary outreach. Mormon missionaries claim to be bringing true Christianity to the world, but in fact they have a completely different God from that of biblical Christianity, a different Jesus and a different gospel. Careful investigation indicates that Joseph Smith was in touch with the same superhuman source of revelation and power that has been the common inspiration behind all pagan religions throughout history. Mormon's uniqueness is in the fact that it was the first really successful attempt to pass paganism off as Christianity. At the heart of Mormon doctrine is the belief that we can become gods and goddesses. This is in fact one of the primary appeals and attractions of Joseph Smith's heretical teachings that you and I can become God. It's beautiful from the outside, but when you peel off the mask and talk to the victims, you uncover another part of the story. The documented evidence you are about to see may seem unbelievable, but it's all true. When they took my family, there wasn't anything else to live for. I tried to kill myself. Thank God I didn't succeed. You know, not all members of the church uh, go to the temple. That may be something that uh, would surprise you, but to gain admittance to the temple, one has to have what's called a temple recommend. He has to receive a satisfactory interview from his bishop and from his stake president. There he's asked, or she has asked, certain rather penetrating questions about their worthiness, their morality. If he's a full tithe payer, that is the only way that we can be with our Heavenly Father. Otherwise, uh, we could not be in his presence. By going through the temple and by adhering to various regulations, such as abstaining from tea or coffee, paying a substantial portion of your income to the Mormon church, and giving free labor to various church-run organizations, the worthy Mormon can become a god himself in the life hereafter, ruling over his own planet with a number of goddess wives. So you can see why the temple is so important to the Latter-day Saint. Because if he is worthy to go into the temple and there receive the sacred ordinances and covenants and keep them, he can eventually grow into becoming a god himself. The Mormon Church teaches that in order for me to become a goddess, I needed to marry a Mormon man in good standing with the church. And without a husband that could take me through the temple, 
I wouldn't be able to go to heaven and be with my Heavenly Father. According to Mormon theology, husbands and wives who have successfully achieved godhood will be required to populate their own planet by procreating as many spirit children as possible. Ever since I was a little girl, I was taught that my primary purpose was to become a goddess in heaven so that I could multiply an earth. And I wanted that. I wanted to be eternally pregnant and look down on an earth and say, that's mine. And I populated that whole earth and all those little babies I had. And to tell you the truth, I find it extremely difficult to believe that the Mormon attorneys and judges I know actually expect to become uh, infinite gods, peopling new worlds and, and engaging in celestial sex with their goddess wives. <laughs> Why don't you ask them? Uh, well, I would be uh, embarrassed, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, if it's true, as you've suggested, that these uh, people do plan to reproduce themselves across the universe, well, I'd rather not know about it. Uh, we do business with these gentlemen. That's why it's such a secret. That's why even the Mormons don't talk about it. They're embarrassed by it, too. Look. Mormonism is based upon the belief that extraterrestrial humanoids from a star in a distant place called Kolob visited this earth, came down to this earth and visited a young boy, 14-year-old boy by the name of Joseph Smith. Space gods from Kolob. Sounds like von Deineken or Battlestar Galactica. But we know it's bizarre. I, I know as a finite being I can never become an infinite god. It's a logical absurdity. That's when I stopped believing it, but I couldn't get my wife to even talk about it. She had to divorce me and find uh, another man that was working his way to godhood, or she could not become a god. Are you saying that the Mormon church pressures individuals into divorcing their spouses when they're not measuring up to the church's standards? and also pressures them into marrying another spouse who is working for this godhood? Greg and Jolene, divorced because of the Mormon church and have now remarried. He was raised Christian and I was raised Mormon. We just had a very beautiful relationship, but it always came back to the Mormonism. I had to convert him in some way. And after two and a half years of really trying hard, I just couldn't do it and I was advised to divorce him. ...who appears in the film The Godmakers, spent 19 years in the Mormon church I recently asked him to reflect on some of the primary teachings of Mormonism. Well, if you could take all the theology of Mormonism and sum it up in one sentence, I think that sentence would be the Mormon axiom of the law of eternal progression. It goes this way, uh, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. They teach that God was once a man who lived on another planet. He grew and earned his right to become a God, and now the Mormon god Elohim lives on a planet called Kolob somewhere in our galaxy with his many thousands of spiritual wives uh, in a polygamous relationship of that sort. And, and Mormonism teaches basically that if each male member of the church is obedient to his priesthood calling, uh, earns the right to become a god himself, that he will go off to another place like that with his many spiritual wives and become a god over some other planet, some other galaxy. Are there any similarities between Christianity and Mormonism? Mormonism, of course, has that veneer of Christianity. It's a Christian cult. Uh, they use the name of Jesus Christ. They talk about Christ. Uh, they pray in his name. It's the name of their church, the Church of Jesus Christ. But, you, again, you've got to look at the Jesus. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians that false teachers will come and bring other Christs. And you've got to take a look at the Mormon Christ and see if he matches up to Christianity or to paganism. And what you get with the Mormon Jesus, he's the brother of Lucifer. He was created through an act of sex uh, by the Mormon God coming down to earth and fathering him with one of his own daughters. Again, there's that Greek mythology coming back into it again. And, and the Jesus of Mormonism was married. He converted water to wine at one of his own weddings. And Joseph Smith himself was supposedly one of his uh, offspring uh, many generations back. And so you, you have a different Christ. 
and you have a you use the same words you 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 look at Christ in Mormonism and they think Jesus but they give a different definition to it they give a different definition to all the theology they use the Christian terms but it has no Christianity at its base Mormons are making an effort to step into Orthodox Christianity are there any dangers in pursuing this type of packaging well, I think it's a real danger, Carol, because you're seeing Mormons running these uh, public service advertisements on television every time you turn on the TV. They look Christian, they smell Christian, they taste Christian, but they're not. There's a veneer, there's a mask over them and their theology, and they're not showing it to the public. It's a Gnostic uh, evil that's being presented as Christian, and people who have no theological background are falling into the trap of thinking the people who are themselves victims of this lie. Joseph Smith's first vision is the cornerstone of the Mormon church, and yet there are nine versions, each of which contradicts the other. Mormon leaders are deliberately keeping from you the true history of their religion, because they know you will have a hard time believing it's from God if you saw how it really was all put together. In the unpublished accounts, we find that Joseph Smith first said it was just Jesus that appeared to him. The second time he wrote a story down, a few years later, he says, many angels appeared to him. Then some years later, he says that two beings appeared. He changes the date, he changes how old he is, he changes the motivation, why he went into the woods to pray, he changes who was there, and he changes what the message was that they gave him. So if he were uh, giving us an actual account of a real experience, we would assume he would have known the first time around whether it was God or Jesus, if it was both of them, what their message was and when it happened. Yet we find him redrafting the story. All of their books, their history, their scriptures, uh, they suppress their diaries because these things show the uh, confusion and the um, man-made nature of the theology and the religion. The Book of Mormon claims to be an actual historical record translated from real plates that Joseph Smith unearthed in a hill in New York. Now, if this is a genuine history, one would assume you could study this just like you would study any historical book. As we look at the Book of Mormon, we find an entirely different story. Instead of being an actual record of actual fact, I have looked over maps, checked uh, archaeological information, and I still am left to wonder, where is the land of Zarahemla? Where is the Valley of Nimrod? Where are the plains of Nephaha? I have been unable to find a record of even one city as mentioned in the Book of Mormon. We turn to the Book of Mormon, we have nothing. There is no Nephite language, there are no Nephite cities. There is not a map in any Book of Mormon. You cannot locate any site. There is no evidence for the book, and yet it's supposed to be a historical record. 